Chelsea, your book, Underestimated, is all about the power of teenage girls. And I love that word power because they are so powerful. And I've done interviews on the podcast in the past about the importance of young people and particularly the importance of young girls' voices throughout history. But your book takes things a step further and you dissect the power and the inner wisdom that is so inherent to teenage girls. So I want to start by asking you, how exactly did you find yourself to be an expert on this topic? <laughs> so I started tutoring teenage girls about 16 years ago, uh, just an academic tutor, and it was kind of a side job and uh, type of thing. And, and then I started slowly but surely realizing how meaningful our one-on-one -on -one time was, how what wise words they were sharing with me, what incredible uh, things they were doing to try to make the world better. And I, it, I it really took me, it took my attention in a way that I was like, wait, we need to be investing in these girls in a big way. And then I started volunteering my time because I realized I didn't want just to help girls that could afford to pay me or something. So I started volunteering my time for girls from underrepresented communities and found that I just loved that space that I was just meant to work with girls and, and that I knew that I could empower and bring out the best of what they have to offer to the world and just it's been a calling of sorts. The title is underestimated, which I think says it kind of sets the stage for what you talk about. But what is your least favorite stereotype about this demo? Well, I say a couple of the, the words in there right from the beginning is the stereotypes of being an emotional and dramatic and crazy. I hate when anyone calls teenage girls crazy or oh, mean, mean. <laughs> I cannot tell you how many times people have heard this. The tip, my book is about teenage girls and been like, what? Teenage girls are so mean. And they just dismiss them. And I want to say, well, teenage girls are not innately mean, <laughs> but it's not who their core identity is. I mean, first of all, that hasn't been my experience of them being mean at all. And I can speak at length about that. But also we've built a society and culture around them that isn't safe that doesn't make them feel safe. So of course there's a reactivity lots of times to what's happening around them. When you say they don't feel safe, what's an example? They feel judged and they feel shamed. So it could be, uh, it could be about around their body, right? Like what they look like. There's just, there's so many shoulds, what they should look like, what they should do, how the, how they should spend their time. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, we, it's very subtle sometimes, but it's also very overt. I mean, dress codes have a real slut shaming aspect to them these days. And girls you know, don't feel safe expressing themselves in their clothes, even though they love doing it so much because they're going to get criticized one way or another. You know, it's either you're too much of this or too much of that. So are you anti-school uniforms, pro-school uniforms? Like, what's your take on it? You know, I'm here I'm trying to also just be the vocal microphone for the girls, right? I am their portal to what they want to say to the world. So it's really not even about always my opinions. I, they tell me over and over and over again how much they hate dress codes. And that would include uniforms for so many reasons. I mean, there are certainly some times where it can work, but the, I want to lean in into a way it's not working, which is, you know, girls will have like a bra strap showing, right? And they get shamed through that dress code in a way it's whether it's the sweater on the hot sweltering day or I know girls who have been sent home right where as a boy might have his pants riding low and his show is showing his boxers and no one cares and the yeah. girls see this happening and what happens is we're telling girls that they're responsible for a boy's inclinations that their body is a threat that it's dangerous that their natural expression of who they want to be in the world is wrong and bad in some way and that those wounds of shame set up shop for long periods of time i find that a lot of these wounds that happen as teenagers carry into adulthood and women are still struggling with them do you think about your own uh, teenage girlhood often? Because this book obviously made me think about mine a lot. Yes. Well, I think the book, even if you don't have a teenage girl in your life, is a lot about healing that inner teenage girl inside of you. Mm -hmm. And that how I struggled then set up patterns that I still deal with today. And I've worked really hard to heal. And I'm trying to go upstream and actually work with girls and help girls so that maybe we don't 
start up those patterns of things like people pleasing and shame and perfectionism and self doubt, which each chapter of the book, as you know, is are those clean topics about around those things. When you talked about body image, I thought a lot about my childhood because I had like larger breasts, um, maybe like starting in eighth grade. And I did feel like my body was a threat and I kind of felt like teased and that like men were felt like entitled to my body. I would see older men looking at me and it really freaked me out when I was a kid. And so that has definitely stayed with me. Is there one that has kind of plagued you? The same one, (laughs) the same one. And I talk about it in the book. I would, in the sexuality chapter, I talk about how teenage girls have told me endlessly about, you know, men staring at their chest and, and what happens is we tell girls, you know, to cover up and that we put all the responsibility and the pressure and the blame on the girl. And we are not socializing boys and men to maybe learn better behavior around these things and that they shouldn't objectify and sexualize young girls. And there's not much messaging to boys at all about this, whereas girls know it so hardcore and it sticks with them, right? Like even when I was doing, I share this in the book, I when I was doing publicity photos for this book, I had some cleavage showing in one of them. And I got so much feedback of God forbid I show cleavage. And I'm talking about teenage girls, all of a sudden, I'm completely discredited. And it was so interesting to hear everyone's perspective on it, how we can, apparently, that's the only thing cleavage can communicate. But this is my, my body, and I should be able to own it. And I talk a lot in the book about how women can now be all things like it, you can be sexy and smart, right? You can be pretty and smart. And how this this new wave of feminism that Gen Z is so a part of in such a beautiful way knows that so much better than older ways of thinking that would has a long history of shaming women for showing cleavage. I actually want to dig into that a little bit because that's something that you've shared with me like in a side conversation is that you feel like a lot of the young girls you work with sort of like a Kim Kardashian figure where she's both an attorney and in a bathing suit on Instagram. And I think as a now 33 year old, like very much a millennial, all of the messaging I received was like, you will not be taken seriously if you post in a bathing suit online. And I want to ask your opinion because I think to some degree that's still the case. And I don't want young girls to like, I don't want to squander the the social movement forward, but I also don't want them to like shoot themselves in the foot. What, what's your take on it? I know it's so hard. I, I hear the conundrum and I'm trying <laughs> to be the voice of change, right? That actually gives them space and creates enough conversations of how we can collectively change around this narrative. Oftentimes a girl is posting selfies or doing these types of things to explore her identity and she needs space to explore and not shame and judgment around it. Mm-hmm. And we need to start the whole entire conversation over, right? And so by only committing to the narrative of like, well, though it might be, it is going to be a problem. You know, we're not actually saying the other part of the conversation, like, well, ask her, like, what would be a way that you felt like, feel like you could explore this side of yourself? Or uh, what are some environments that you would feel safe to explore that clothing or explore that look that you're trying to find in yourself? Um, Because instead what girls hear is, you are shamed, you are judged, and they just shut down Mm -hmm. instead. That's such a nice alternative. So like, how can you explore that part of you or that look maybe outside of social media at first? Yeah. Yeah. And it can be, I mean, you know, I've had lengthy conversations with girls about posting on social media and what that might mean for them and respecting their voice Mm -hmm. and perspective in the conversation. That's another thing. Girls are so much smarter than you think they are. They want to be a part of the conversation. So what happens a lot is society or parents or whatever it might be, be like, don't do that. That's bad. And they just shut it down. And what I have been in the trenches of is actually asking the girl herself. And I I talk a lot in the book about just having that level of curiosity, non-judgmental curiosity, where you ask, how does this make you feel? Like, what are your thoughts on that? Are you posting that in order to get likes? Are you trying to get a crush's attention? Like ask her and and respect her thoughts and don't have an agenda in asking her so that she can actually talk it out and figure it out for herself rather than us projecting her story onto her. 
I really like that, Chelsea. I love the idea of curiosity over criticism. And so it's such a nice way of, of navigating that. So you write on page 52, sometimes a girl just needs to sit with who she is, explore it and find some peace around it. Kind of goes in tangent with what we just spoke about, but what did you mean when you wrote that? Yeah. So because there's so much messaging of what she should be, whether it's from the media or her friends around her, you know, there's so many shoulds that I have tried to carve out space and talk to girls about what it looks like for them to sit with who they are and listen and find connection to an inner voice. And I ask them even to use their own words to describe it, right? Like they use different ways to say, oh, I'm connecting to my heart or my gut or my intuition or my inner voice. I try to even make sure they name it in a way that feels right to them. And then I ask them what places and time and space do you feel that those thoughts are exactly aligned with who you are. And when does that happen for you? So I say sit with, but sit with can be different. It's often, you know, time with yourself and connecting to yourself, exploring what makes you feel good in liking who you are in the world. And so it's connecting to authenticity is what it is. And how do we create spaces for them to do that rather than projecting a ton of shoulds at them? First of all, those are really big questions. Like that's a hard question to answer to say like, when do you feel aligned and connected to yourself? And nobody asked me that till I was like 30 something, I think. <laughs> That's right. so beautiful that you're like asking them those questions at 13, 14. I know, right? That's how we change the world. That's exactly what I'm talking about, moving these conversations upstream because we are underestimating them and their ability to have these types of conversations. And I often say when they do figure something out, that's really cool. I mean, I've had girls talk about trauma responses with me and their mother wound, you know, things that I know women have not even begun to deal with until their 40s. Yeah. And here is a 16-year-old in front of me thinking through it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, your life is going to be so different because you're starting in such a different, healthier place. Yeah. You're not going to make like all these decisions from a wounded place. And maybe you make a few, but you know, that's everybody's journey. Yeah. And to give an example of this, listening to the voice, I, there's one in there that's Marley. She was a volleyball player and she was really, really good at it. And so we know we love girls to be good at things. And what happens too is when you're good at something, it tends to be the only thing we focus on. And we're like, do that, do that, do that. And we don't create enough room again for a girl to explore. So Marley was making the varsity team as a freshman and everyone was affirming her for it. And then her and her mom had played volleyball. And so everyone was so proud. And I realized she was getting migraines and stomach aches and was so stressed out by the volleyball schedule. And I one day just decided to ask her like, hey, do you like playing volleyball? <laughs> and that, she was shocked. Like literally no one had ever asked her if she liked playing volleyball, right? It was really just like, so she responded, well, I like that I'm good at it. And I'm like, right, yeah, you're good at it. But do you like spending your time playing it? And then she said, well, I guess I can bond with my mom about it. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I go, do you, are you playing volleyball to make your mom happy? And she looked at me all wide eyed and was like, oh shit. And I like, she realized how much almost people pleasing was also involved in her choices. And then I asked her, well, what would actually bring you joy? Like, where are you finding joy? And she said that she would do fashion sketches on the bus ride to games. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, there's a sewing class this weekend that you should take on the weekends. And she was like, oh my gosh, can I do that? And slowly but surely, she ended up quitting the volleyball team with the support of her mom and her migraines went away and her stomach aches went away and she became excellent at fashion design. Like she also had tons of excellence in that place too, but she was so much happier. So, but no one was even permissioning the space for her to explore and ask her what she wants. When you say explore, do you mean that we let boys explore more so? Or like, can you talk to me more about the idea of exploration in girlhood? Yes. And it has a lot to do with mistakes also. Like we let boys make mistakes and be messy and it's just not a big deal. It's not they're part of their core idea identity. Whereas when girls make a mistake or do something imperfectly, it's it somehow is absorbed into like, I'm not good enough. Uh, there's a lot more messaging on girls being perfect and likable. That is what, you know, everyone's so worried about teenage girls being so stressed out and having so much anxiety. I would say those two pressures are the main source element to be perfect and to be likable. And so, so it kind of means something about them as a person versus just like a skill set. Exactly. Got exactly. It. Yeah. One of the girls they share in the books loves to do things she's bad at. I think it's so great because 
what if you just spent time doing things you were bad at? Like, it seems like a <laughs> radical idea, but she, it brings her joy and she can explore and there's less pressure on her. And uh, it's a space that girls don't get to spend time in a lot. Yeah, I think so. On a biological and psychological level, can you explain what's happening with girls when they enter their teen years? Um, because you say that there's a wisdom that's actually brewing. Yeah. Well, so the biology behind it, there are better books from, you know, doctors and psychologists and stuff to explain like hormones at that time and so on. But what I'm trying to lean into is how they have way deeper thoughts and reflections and perspectives at a much younger age than people think that they're ready for. So I've had a lot of moms be like, when is the time to be radically honest with your daughter? I talk about there's a chapter radical honesty in there and being way more honest. And moms are really scared to get that honest with their daughter. And I often tell them like, she's so much readier for that conversation way earlier than you think she is. And the sooner you can set that, those foundations of trust, the sooner she's going to start connecting to her own truth, her own honesty. And that's when you really start seeing uh, wisdom flow out of her at a young age. I have a question about that. I want to understand what your perspective is on the line uh, there, because I think of obviously my own mother and she was always so honest with me and um, about taboo topics, right? Like she was so honest with me about sex at a young age. And at the same time, I think sometimes when parents tell children honest stories, it almost gives the kids unspoken permission to also do those things. And so, for instance, if your mom says, um, yeah, I, I tried weed when I was 13. I didn't like it, but I tried it. I feel like that kind of gives the kid permission a little bit. So how do you share your honest story and also not give permission to things that you don't want them doing? Right. So it's a great question. And again, it's just continuing the conversation. So what do you need to keep talking? So maybe a mom does say that, but then you say, well, what do you think about that? What do you think about the fact that I smoked weed at that age? Do you feel like that was an appropriate age for me to do that? Like include her in the analysis of it and respect her thoughts on it. Because when she knows that you respect and trust her thoughts, she up levels. She's like, oh, well, like, I got to think of something smart to say. And then you affirm and say, oh, that was really smart. That was a, because most likely a girl might, I have, I've had this kind of conversation, honestly, with a girl. And yeah. she gives me a really fair assessment of the drinking culture and all these kind of taboo things. And I'm like, well, what do you think? What do you evaluate is a healthy participation in this <laughs> for yourself? So, And then she has to sit and think about it. She has to connect to herself, connect to what she believes about this, what would make her happy, what feels healthy, because I am trusting her to evaluate that for herself. And when I tr give her that type of trust, she rises to the occasion. So you've worked with so many young girls at this point. What is similar to our teenage experience and what is wildly different in 2024? Well, these girls are definitely more activists in general. They want to make change. Like they are not going to be quiet. Like they do not want to be silenced, which I just love, which is a huge part of this book too, is activating, like telling the world, hey, we do not silence these girls because they are an under underestimated power in the world, mm -hmm. a power for positive change. Right. And so I don't remember, and I'm kind of an activist type of person. I am, right? But I was not even that dialed up at that age mm -hmm. as they were. And then secondly, there's a women supporting women culture. It's a big shift. Uh, growing up, I felt, you know, there was still that mentality of one seat at the table for a woman, uh, whether, you know, it's in that boardroom or whatever table you're trying to set at. And these girls have had better access to media where women have been in places of power more and so on. So they don't see it that way. And there's a lot more women supporting women narratives of like girls just gassing each other up and uh, encouraging each other. I mean, they encourage me. <laughs> like, they're it's great. Amazing. At that. I see that all the time. I'll go to a restaurant. I was on a date a few months ago and I was at a restaurant in Vegas. I, I don't talk about my dating life often on this podcast, but I was at a restaurant in Vegas and this, the hostess was probably like 19 and she seats us. And then she comes back five minutes later and she goes, I just have to tell you, you're so pretty. And I was like, that is so, you know, we had our moment and the guy looked at me and he was like, 
that's like happened while we've been together before. And I was like, it has nothing to do with me. It's this young generation of girls that are so freaking awesome and hype each other up. It's so, yeah. we never did that. It's so beautiful and it's contagious. Totally. And yeah, we were taught to compete. There, that yep. whole idea that women compete, it's so, it's so sad and destructive and I can still see so much harm in older generations of it still playing out. And that's why I'm really trying to shine a light on like, no, they're doing it better than us. Let's do what they're doing. <laughs> so, okay, I'm going to switch gears to a little bit of sadness. Um, but I read this study that was published by the CDC in 2023, and it found that 57% of high school girls reported experiencing persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness in the past year. And that was up 36% from 2011. So that's also nearly twice as high as males, which I found pretty astounding. How much of that can be attributed to social media and smartphones? And what is going on here? Yeah. So... I am very familiar with this study. And of course, you know, so many people reached out about it. Um, I first want to take it back real quick to what I said about, I believe the pressure on girls to be perfect and likable is the ba like the root of everything uh, of what I'm seeing on the girls. And that's what they tell me. That's what they tell me. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of social media, and this is a complex issue, okay? I'm not going to try to make huge generalizations here. I, of course, there are really problematic, toxic aspects that are not good. And social media is not going anywhere. <laughs> so what I have really leaned into is a much more positive conversation, which is about media literacy, which is just a boring way of saying that I talk with the girls about the accounts that they're following and the shows that they're watching. And I do it in this like lighthearted, I'm actually interested in it type of way, not in a, oh my gosh, put your phone down, that social media is destroying you and judge, judge, judge. Because the minute they feel the judgment and the shame that close down, close off, you know, the doors are shut mm -hmm. and you're not going to be able to connect with them. So I have been able to help girls find a healthy relationship to social media without a doubt, just by b being curious, just by guiding through, giving ideas, talking it out with them. I know plenty of girls that, you know, set their phone aside at night because they don't want to scroll. So it's not like they're incapable of this. So I hate when it's like we just say social media is the villain that has destroyed girls and their mental health. Okay. Because I actually think we, there's, there's more intense things going on is that we're teaching them fear, first of all. We're coming at them with so much fear about this social media conversation, and we're not coming at them with trust that they can navigate it and tools to navigate it in a way that is empowering and also flows with their natural inclinations. So a lot of what's out there is really like, do this, do that, you know, that's bad. And instead being like, my one of my favorite things to say to a girl is, what do you think the solution is? I, I constantly ask her that. And their solutions are so much better than our solutions. And when she comes up with it herself, then she does it, right? Like I could tell a girl, well, maybe you should put your phone away at night. And she'd be like, it's so stupid to even think of me telling a girl that. Like not the, basically I say, well, okay, so how have you been feeling at night? Like, okay, you've been, she'll share with me. She's been scrolling endlessly. And I'm like, how'd that make you feel? And then she'll share, oh, it was, I don't know. It didn't feel good. I'm like, okay, well, what do you think is a solution to do about it? And then she'll come up with ideas and we just talk it out in a way that I have no agenda, I'm not judging her, I'm just talking it out with her and respecting and trusting her choices. What do you think the solution is, is a revolutionary question that we could all be asking our friends and family as well, not just teenage girls, instead of just like giving our opinions unsolicited. Exactly. So everyone loves to fix each other. They love, we love to slap positivity on people's problems. We love to solution them and, and project our story onto their story. So I see girls just wanting me to listen to their feelings. So oftentimes I'll even, I phrase everything as a question. I'll be like, do you want me to just listen to you right now? Or do you want, do you want ideas on solutions? And usually they just want me to listen. I mean, you're talking to the, the queen of, of loving questions. So uh, you're, you're, you're in the right space. I love that. On the topic of social media, can you talk a little bit about your discovery on how teens are using the AI chat function on Snapchat. Yeah, so when it came out, the, they were using that AI bot 
like as a therapist, as a best friend and asking it really serious questions. And I was like, wait, what? You know, I was like, and it was interesting. They would show me some of the answers and I was like, oh, that's not a bad idea necessarily, but it was still alarming. But it, this is what it was. It was the actual key. And it comes back to my main point again. AI doesn't judge them. They feel no judgment from AI. Therefore, they can actually honestly share their truth. And wow, what a revelation. They're getting like, advice back you know what if we did that in our human connection instead maybe we could have more honest connective relationships with each other this is so thoughtful okay so for many of us who don't have contact with teenage girls often what do you think are easy entry points because i remember when i was a teenage girl the question after i was like probably 15, the question everybody asked me was, so where do you want to go to college? And I wanted to cry every time they asked me. Like, I I remember telling my mom, like, I'm not going to any of your friends' houses anymore. Like, I can't ask, answer that question anymore. So 100%. what's a better entry point? Yeah. So um, by the way, that is so achievement focused, that question, by the way. And it's telling a girl that she is not going to be worthy unless she goes to a good college is, yeah. is how she hears that question. And that her worth is tied to her going to college. And that's the same thing with grades. It's same things with all a lot of the questions we ask girls is very achievement focused. So First of all, I think that the media, so back to media, right? As much as everyone wants to villainize it, I think it is the way in to connecting with teenage girls. And is find out which TV shows they're watching. Fingers crossed. <laughs> if you can find a common TV show, you are golden. That is always the best starting point. I've had the deepest conversations with girls about who loves who on a TV show. And it's like, well, why do you think he likes her? You know, why do you think she likes him? Like you can really unpack some deep conversations from those type of questions. And then I like to ask actually the, the really deep questions to girls where I'll be like, what do you think beauty is? <laughs> <laughs> Something like that, you know, and I love their responses because uh, they sit and think about it. You know, a girl like sharing the book talks about it being the energy you share, which I was like, oh, my gosh, that is such a great answer. Right. It's so profound. So, yeah. And uh, so, I, again, it's kind of like I like asking them really deep philosophical questions. I'll also ask them about what they care about in the world, like what problems do they want to fix? What pulls at their heart? Like what makes them kind of sad that that hasn't been fixed? And what do they wish they could make better about that? And that kind of is a generative conversation too that connects them to their heart and, and more meaningful topics than like where you're going to college. You have to also check yourself and think, what is my actual curiosity around what she's going through in life right now? Like, I mean, you could say, are you feeling a lot of pressure around your grades and getting into college? Like change the question a little bit so that she feels seen and she feels understood. So it's more about what do you think and how do you feel? Yeah. I yeah. love that. Okay. So we've touched on this, but I want to kind of like drive it home because I think you you share it so beautifully. You talk a lot about holding space for teenage girls. So I think holding space for anybody is important. We could all be working on that. But in terms of teachers and parents specifically, why is it important to rethink how we're communicating with teens, but specifically girls? Yeah. So it's about their feelings and, uh, you know, everyone likes to say big feelings that they have. I actually believe everyone has big feelings and that as we move into adulthood, we're taught how to squash and contain and repress yeah. these feelings and box them in because, oh my gosh, what if you were to have a moment where you're annoyed or irritated or angry or these kind of quote unquote displeasing feelings, frustrated, disappointed. And so instead by making space, holding space and making room for them to share something that isn't that great, a space of discomfort, then it actually processes through them and it releases. It's not possible to have positive, happy feelings at every second. And what we're teaching girls is when we squash that space. So when you see a girl that's feeling pain, right? Of course, you want to make it better right away. You don't want to see her that way. So you slap positivity on it. You try to give her a solution right away. But what you're teaching her is that her feelings are bad and you got to not do that. You got to avoid it at all costs, right? To feel those more uncomfortable feelings. But they get they come out eventually and usually in really unhealthy ways. They could come out physiologically. There's so many different ways they're finding that repressed feelings are problematic. So by holding space, and I'm going to say specifically for displeasing feelings, 
we're also helping her feel understood uh, mm -hmm. and feel seen and just her humanity. We're all messy humans that are all just dealing with stuff sometimes. And I always recommend using the exact words that she used back. We we're like, yeah, that, that does suck. That sounds really frustrating. Right. I agree. That sounds annoying. And then that's it. <laughs> that's all you say. I love the idea of affirming somebody because we all crave that. That's like, that's all we want even in a fight with a spouse or a partner. Okay. So you say that teenage girls crave trust and we talked about fear in regards to social media, but I learned from your book that we're kind of leading with fear when we address teenage girls across the board. Why is that such a mistake? Yeah. Fear is, <laughs> it doesn't generate anything positive. Usually <laughs> it doesn't. I, to me, I, I've, been really fortunate. I was raised in a way that there wasn't a lot of fear. So I kind of experienced what it feels like to not have a ton of fear. People always call me fearless and stuff. And I know it, and I, it sounds almost obnoxious to share that because of course we're all struggling with fear, <laughs> but there is a liberation. Like, you know, the last chapter is liberation. And when you know, we all know what it feels like when you're not feeling fear, you feel free and you feel liberated and you feel like you're your authentic self. You feel connected to who you are. Fear is like a gripping contained energy that, um, you know, I talk about worry in there a lot. Worry is just the, this energy that takes up all this space in your brain and your heart. And if you weren't expending energy on that, it's instead open to so many other brave possibilities for your life. There's this magic that you talk about when a teenage girl feels good about herself, free to be her authentic self, probably the opposite of fear. How do you want to see the power that you talk about of being a teenage girl harnessed in our society? I would love a lot more messaging around loving girls exactly the way they are. It can come down to like letting them wear what they want, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is a pretty bold statement uh, for parents, at least I know it is. I have found a huge squashing happens when a girl doesn't get to wear what she wants. You write about, I'm sorry. So it, you say like the teenage, teenagers have a habit of saying, I'm sorry all the time. And we've all seen the Instagram memes where like women in general have a habit of saying, I'm sorry all the time. That's 100% a pattern that starts with teenage girls and carries into womanhood. <laughs> the pattern that you're talking about, you say like oftentimes stems from their obsession with perfection. So this is a two-part question. One, can you explain how it ties to perfection? And then also, how do we grow out of some of these traits as we get older? Because I think a lot of us haven't. Yeah. Great questions. As I would expect from you, the queen of questioning. <laughs> uh, I, okay. When she's saying sorry or when I'm saying sorry, I mean, I had the same habit for sure. And I've gotten so much better at, um, is it's kind of like, you want to take up too much space. You want everyone to be happy around you. You want to make sure everyone else is good and taken care of and happy before yourself. So it's tied to people pleasing too. So both perfectionism and people pleasing, oh. uh, because by making sure everyone around you is like feeling good and that you're not taking too much trouble, then you feel there's a stabilizing thing of like, okay, well, I'm being, I'm being good. I'm being, it's like a good girl mentality, right? Like I'm showing up perfectly because everyone is happy with me, <laughs> right? And so sorry foresees all potentials where it's like, oh my gosh, well, sorry. You know, like if you accidentally perceive this as not great, I've already said sorry, just in case you think that, you know, so that they're happy and it's about their needs coming first. So another phrase that's the big one is, it's fine. Oh my gosh, and I, I talk about in the book, but girls, you know, they'll tell me horrific stories and then be like, but it's fine. I like to say, hey, you know what? It's not fine. That was, that sounds awful. And also we want to help them realize what is and isn't fine. Yeah. But usually they're doing that because they're sensing your discomfort with the painful thing they're talk talking about. And no one can just handle sitting in the discomfort space because we have no space for women and girls to sit with displeasing energies like frustration, anger, these things like that. And there is permission for boys to feel anger. I will say that there is a clear gender difference in this. To answer your second question, which is how do we stop doing it? So I have just quite simply brought awareness to it, right? Like it, with levity. I, whenever we're doing something in this space, I like to laugh at myself. I like to, yeah, so 
what I committed to it when I'm working with a girl too. Like if I say sorry, she can call me on it. And we're like, hey, wait, you don't have to say sorry. And so when she does it, we make an agreement that I'm going to point it out every time she does it or she'll do it to me. And then it's just straight up awareness, right? All of a sudden they're like, oh, whoa, wait, I say it that much? People who listen every week will have heard me say this before, but a therapist said to me one time, why are you so willing to make yourself uncomfortable to make other people comfortable? And that was the first time I realized I engaged in any of this behavior and I'm still trying to undo it. I'm not there. I still put myself in compromising positions to make other people comfortable. It's like a, it's a lifelong thing. Exactly. I mean, you're nailing it. I mean, so much of that runs through this book. Yeah. And and it comes back to, again, just what if we taught girls to actually check in with themselves and say, what are my needs? What what pleases me? And because when I tell a girl, hey, it's not fine, let's focus on your needs for a second. Don't worry about my needs. Like, what do you need right now? What kind of support do you need around this awful thing you just told me? Yeah. <laughs> this podcast was born from the book, uh, Beauty Sick. And uh, in it, she talks about how no matter who or what you are as a girl or a woman, the most important thing you must be is pretty. And so I started asking people who the prettiest woman in their life was. And everybody said their mom, their sister, their aunt, their grandmother. No, not one person said the Instagram girl I followed yesterday. Right. Um, and I started thinking about women that were pretty bold, pretty witty, pretty strong, pretty smart. And you have this great section about compliments. And that's all I could think about. Um, because in the book, I learned from her that when you compliment a woman on her appearance, she actually feels more insecure about her appearance, even if she's being complimented. Because all she starts thinking about is how her hair looks or what her weight is or how her eyelashes look. You can see how insecure, oftentimes girls who are societally defined as pretty, tend to face the most insecurity because they their self-worth is tied to this really intangible thing that feels out of control also. So you have this totally new take on compliments. So why do you think we're getting compliments all wrong? Yes. I talk at length about giving really specific, long compliments that see a person's weirdness, right? Specificity. It's all about increasing specificity, length, frequency. You know, so often girls who are high achieving, you, we think that we're complimenting them like, oh my God, you're awesome. You're so amazing. We think we're like helping their confidence. Right? But what they're hearing is, oh my gosh, my good grades, my self-worth is tied to my good grades. Like that's what makes me worthy. Right. <laughs> and so it is actually about really deeply listening as usual um, and thinking about what makes a person unique. So it could be like, oh, you give off such a warm, loving energy. Or I love the way that you thoughtfully follow up after we hang out and always send a thoughtful note. You know, like it's some, I, I, something that they do. I, it takes practice, okay? You really have to start looking at people, like taking a slower beat and looking at a person's uniqueness. And I would, I like to use weird because I actually find it's an easier way in because we can spot a person, what makes a person weird because we're all, somehow we were conditioned to think that weird is bad. I think weird is awesome and it's everything and it's connected to your authenticity. It's a huge part of this entire conversation. So I own the word weird in a big way, but that's an easier way in sometimes is when you're like, well, what makes that person weird? <laughs> And then shift it in a compliment type of language and bring enthusiasm to it and do it longer than you think you need to be. I always say write a compliment that's three sentences long, not one mm -hmm. sentence, uh, because it does force you to go into the next layer and the next layer. It's funny you say that because I, I remember a text you sent me a few months ago and I read it and I was like, that is true. Like we didn't know each other that well at that point. And you sent me something that made me feel so seen. And I was like, that was one of the kindest compliments I've ever received. And then when I read your chapter, I was like, this is so beautiful that you are so practiced at this. I'm, you give this gift to all the people in your life, I'm sure. Oh, thank you. And that, yeah. And you know what? It's this beautiful exchange of energy too. Like I really have a lot of quality, loving relationships where there's a lot of connectedness because people feel seen. And, and I surround myself with, help, with people that really see me. And 
the more I feel seen in my weirdness or authenticity, the more then it becomes confident and I express it bigger. And uh, so I love to give it as a gift to people. Like it is a gift you can give to anyone all the time and it is free. <laughs> but yeah, it takes a moment to get outside yourself and sit and think for a second. It's a practice for sure. Okay, so I want to take a step back because you've been so generous with your knowledge, but I really, I want to know about the woman behind this book because um, I have armchair theory that when people go into passionate professions, we are doing it to heal a part of ourselves oftentimes. And uh, I'm wondering how this book helped you reconnect with your inner teen. Yeah, I was, I was adultified. And there wasn't much space. My parents got divorced and I had to be what I felt like the stabilizing force. And so there wasn't space for my feelings. And I 100% needed, I thought the more perfect I was, the more pleasing I was, the more I would avoid pain in life. And then of course that completely wrenched open in my 30s. And so yes, I do feel like I've been called to this work in healing my inner teenage girl and being the person in those girls' lives that I didn't have for myself. But yes, I think your theory is correct in that we are called to passionate work and it's a healing journey. I think so. Before you leave me, I have a few rapid fire questions. What right. is a character that you are drawn to in a movie, book, or TV show? Jane Austen. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Okay, you are a fabulous writer. So what is a go-to writing tip that you lean on to encourage your pen or your typewriter Ooh. or your computer to find? Okay, I mean, obviously, I, there's so many things. It's the hardest thing ever, right? Like setting aside time to write. Here's a really good one, though, that, gosh, does it work. Uh, before you finish work for the day, like you're, end, you're kind of coming to a close of writing that day, finish when you know exactly what you're going to write next. Like you, you love the idea, you know exactly what you're going to write and then stop there because then when you start the next day, it's so easy to get working. You're just like, oh, right. No, I know exactly what I'm going to write. And then you get into flow so much faster rather than kind of like sitting fresh again at the beginning of the next day. That is such a good tip. I've never heard anyone say that. Yeah. I just discovered it on my own. <laughs> Fabulous. Okay. What is a book that you've read? Something that you think everybody should read? The Gifts of Imperfection, Brene mm -hmm. Brown. I think that it really is structured in a way that's so accessible, digestible, and that each chapter is something about life and living a more full, authentic life in the best of ways. What is a hard but freeing truth that you've learned? That I don't need anything outside of me to tell me I'm good or worthy. Whew. If I were in person, I'd say snaps. That's a good one. <laughs> so tell me when to stop. Stop. How would you describe yourself to a stranger? High energy and enthusiastic. I kind of have to tell people because otherwise they're like, is this for real? <laughs> <laughs> and so when they learn that like I'm aware of my enthusiasm, they're like, oh, okay, okay. She's at least aware of it. <laughs> I love enthusiastic people. I think you're also um, incredibly warm. You're inviting. You are um, careful with your words. You're thoughtful. You're an add value person. I could go on. But Oh, thank you. Thanks for the compliments. Look at that. She gave yes. me such a gift right now. And my last question is, what is the smartest decision you've ever made? I've made a lot of smart decisions. <laughs> And by the way, this is me also trying to sh model women, like taking up space and owning their power. And I, it's been a journey for me to say that boldly and own it. I yeah. really have made a lot of smart decisions. And uh, I think moving to Los Angeles was a really good one for me. It really opened up my life and it gave me exposure and access to things that would make my dreams come true. I think it was a bet on yourself. <laughs>